five times and I can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> More or less? Ready. Less okay. or more? Oh, we've got tape and we'll just run it and see how it goes. Okay, stand by. <laughs> Welcome back, folks. You're used to seeing David Holt in this position, but I decided to give him a little break today since the show is dedicated to women in traditional American music. I'm at the Renfro Valley Barn Dance in Renfro Valley, Kentucky, and with me is one of my favorite musicians, Lily Mae Ledford. Lily Mae played in a group in the 1930s called the Coon Creek Girls and has been playing music ever since. How you doing? <laughs> Just fine. I wonder if you could tell me what it was like starting out in the music business in the 1930s. Well, it was pretty rough, I'll tell you. We, we began to meet with some hostility from the, from the more polished musicians on the show, and they were nearly all men, very few women in the business. And they could make it rough on a poor old girl, you know, that didn't mean any harm. And they acted a little as though we were upstarts, you know. But uh, down through the years, more and more girls came into the music. And the boys got nicer and nicer. And now they ain't no trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear one of your hot banjo tunes here, one that's on your newest record, in fact, called Charming Betsy. I'll do it if you'll help me. I'll, I'll try. Welcome back, folks. I know you're used to seeing David Holt here, but I decided to give him a little bit of a break since today's show is dedicated to women in American music. I'm here at the Renfro Valley Barn Dance in Renfro Valley, Kentucky. With me is one of the pioneers of women in traditional American music, Lily Mae Ledford. Hi, Lily Mae. Hi. How are you doing? All right. What was it like starting to play music in the 1930s on stage and on the radio as a woman? Well, I tell you, it could get pretty rough because there wasn't many women in the business. It was mostly the men and the boys, and they felt very much in the saddle, and they were. But uh, a few of us managed to, to edge in, you know, occasionally, and so they, we met with some hostility from the more polished musicians. They worked so hard to perfect theirs, and they saw mine was rough and, and very rough, and they, uh, they uh, I don't know, they, they were a little hostile. They, they, and it could tease and torment and get pretty insulted sometimes. So it wasn't easy at all. But then down through the years, as women came into it more and more all the time, they began to get a little nicer and a little nicer and begin to accept us a little more. And uh, 
and now then they, the, they, they don't see nothing at all. They're good to us. Well, Lily Mae, you're a wonderful banjo player. Maybe I could get you to pick a tune here with me. How about Charming Betsy? If you'll sing it with me. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> Maggie Valley. Let me rest a minute from singing. Okay. Yeah. Close up of camping and you didn't drink water. Just like what you said, mm -hmm. same position. Sure. And just cue us back to say the stomp and gallop. Okay. You might look over at Lily May like you just finished. Don't, let's don't let that white thing be in the picture. Let's put see. Kind of stir it here. Let's get on back to the stomping ground. One more time. A little, little more relaxed. Slower. Let's get on back to the stomping ground. Once again, a little more, a little more up. Okay. <clears throat> thank, tell her thank you. Thank of course. You Thanks very much, Lily May. That was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Let's get on back to the stomping ground now. One more time. Maintain eye contact. Try it again. Thank you very much, Lily May. That was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Let's get on back to the stomping ground. Okay, <laughs> Let's, uh... Welcome back. I know you're used to seeing David Holt here, but I decided to give him a little break today since we're doing a show on women in American music. And I'm at the Renfro Valley Barn Dance in Renfro Valley, Kentucky. With me is one of the pioneers of traditional American country music, Lily Mae Ledford. Hi, Lily Mae. Oh, hello. <laughs> I know you've been playing music professionally since the 1930s, and I wonder if you could tell me what it was like for women back when you started. Well, it's pretty well, rough, I'll tell you. All right. Uh, mention the, the group, Clean Good Girls. Sorry. As a pioneer. Okay, stand by. You still rolling, Jack? Yes. Stand by. Welcome back. I know you're used to seeing David Holt here, but I decided to give him a little break since today's show is dedicated to women in American music. I'm at the Renfro Valley Barn Dance in Renfro Valley, Kentucky, and with me is Lily Mae Ledford from the Coon Creek Girls, one of the pioneer groups for women in traditional American country music. Hi, Lily Mae. Hello. Since you've been in the business since the 1930s, I wondered if you could 
Tell me what it was like for a woman starting out when you started your career. Oh boy, it was pretty rough, I'll tell you. And we met, we met with some friendliness, but we also met with much hostility, especially from the more polished musicians of, of, among the men and the boys. And it had been a, a, a boys and the men thing for a long time, and, and girls were kind of new, and uh, so they, uh, they, they acted as though we were moved in on their territory, and uh, some at times they were, they, some would tease, and some would like to torment, and some could get insulting, and, and you know, that, that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, we'd often get feelings hurt, but our music was rough as compared to theirs, yet we had so many fans, and the, they didn't draw the crowds or the fans that we did. So uh, I can see why they, uh, they felt justified in uh, giving us hard time. <laughs> but anyway, down through those 48 years, more and more girls came into the music. So the, they began to accept us. Let's have a, we let's have a good tune now. All right, how about Thurman Betsy? <laughs> to the stomping ground. <coughs> no, I was going to sing the same one twice and then, and then call myself and turn it back around. Something like that. Same way if it wasn't on the network. That all had to be tied and perfected and all. The Lord, I still die hard. I feel like radio. You feel like singing a little bit of Charmin' Betsy? No, the questions are questions to be responsible. The interview. Oh, we're doing that again. Okay, sorry. Um, okay. Lily May, I know you started your career back in the 1930s. Can you tell me what it was like for a woman performing traditional music back then? Well, I'll tell you, it was pretty rough back then. <laughs> and we, uh, girls were, very few of them were in radio, and the ones that were coming in, especially Mountain woman like me, way I talk and all, music rough, you know. Uh, it was pretty rough because we got a little static or a little hostility from some of the men musicians. They'd always uh, been at the head of, of that business. And uh, so they we met with some hostility and some teasing and tormenting and, and uh, about the way of talk and the rough music. And they were polished musicians, uh, the, the ones that uh, Sometimes there'll be there'll be one or two that shows downright contempt for us. Now I I, I, I I don't blame them too much about for that because they were they were the dedicated musicians and they had perfected what they were doing. I never tried to perfect anything, and uh, but we would we attracted the fans. The Coon Creek girls would attract fans, you know, and then draw crowds where the polished musicians could not. And I understand how they felt, you know. They they as it, as it went down through those 48 years I was in it, 
music, more and more girls came into the music, and uh, the men became, they, they accepted them eventually, and now they're downright good to us. How about one of those hard driving old time songs like Charming Betsy? How about it? If you'll sing it with me, I'll sing it. Let's go. Okay, this is a uh, question from Linda. Say hello first, or we've no, already uh, done that more or less? Yeah, we've, we've already done that part of the interview. Uh, just ask the question. Ready, Rob? Mm -hmm. Okay. Lily Mae, what was it like back in the 1930s as a woman starting out in country music? Let's do another one. Just relax a little bit. Yeah. Uh, a little more, a little more enthusiasm in your voice. Okay. Lily May, you've been in the business for over 48 years. What was it like when you started out performing in the 1930s? Okay, let's just try one more. No response for me. No. <laughs> These are just empty questions that have no answer. <laughs> Is there any other way you want me to word it? Or just? No, just, just try it. Lily Mae, you've been in. Let the car go by. 
Oops. Jeff, if those cars are any problem, I'll pop this thing out. <laughs> Lily Mae, you've been in the business for over 48 years, and I'm curious what it was like for a woman in country music starting out in the 1930s. Cut. Okay, this is going to be, this is going to cue the song. Okay. going to cue the song. And then. Well, let's play. Um, yeah, yeah. Are we rolling? Let's pick a little bit of that charming Betsy. I bet. Before we go into that again, um, just give me a break there. Don't don't play. Just so we've got that as a separate and, and we thing. We need a response to like Lily May has answered that question. Okay. Uh, and say that sounds like a lot of work. Or um, stop tape. Just smile like you're responding to her question. Well, it sounds like it was pretty hard back then. I have a lot of respect for you sticking with it. How about picking Charming Betsy to get? Oh, we need a. Not play any. I'll play any. Oh, well, good. We'll just, yeah. just so she, <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it again. Was that all right? You need more inflection uh, or? Uh, yeah, make it a little. Don't stretch it on too much. <laughs> you, you probably still want to pick up your banjo and hold it. Well, she's not or, in shot. So she's not. Oh, okay. Shot. Goodness. Okay. Sounds like it was pretty hard back then. Let's pick a little bit of that charming Betsy with the hot banjo. Try a little more inflection again. Relax a little bit. Okay. How can I inspire you now? I don't know. <laughs> How to... can you inspire me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're acting. Just <laughs> acting, man. That's good. Yeah. Sounds like it was pretty hard back then, Lily May. Let's have a bit of an old time tune here, a favorite called Charming Betsy. Try it again. Sorry. A little more, a little more emotion, a little, a little more up. You just kind of monotone. Bring it up a little, a little more enthusiasm. Right? What? A tear. A tear. There we go. <laughs> Lily May, it sounds like things were awfully hard back then when you got started, um, but you're still playing. So let's pick another good tune here. How about Charming Betsy? Once again. Lily May, it seems like it was awfully hard when you got started. I think I'm glad I got started just a few years ago. How about picking a tune together? Charming Betsy, an old favorite. One more time. And then for a little bit more. Yeah, you look way off camera, too. Lily May, it seems like it was awfully hard back then when you got started. How about if we, uh, all right, that sucks. Let's do it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm that's not looking around here and <laughs> causing it. Lily May, it seems like it was awfully hard back then when you got started playing music, but you've been a big inspiration to me, and I'd love to hear you play that banjo. Let's pick a little bit of Charming Betsy. Okay. Stop. Okay. Let's, let's do this one with the intro and then go into the song. Okay. Um, Lily May, it sounds like it was awfully hard back then in the 1930s, but I'm glad you stuck with it so I could get a chance to play a song with you here tonight. And how about a little bit of Charming Betsy? All right. <laughs> Coming round mountain, 
thank you. <coughs> Pastor? stomping ground. Let's do a thanks Lily May and back to the stomping ground again. A little more, a little more emotion, a little more up. Okay. Stomping ground. No, no, you don't have to start there. All right. <laughs> can you do it without leaning way around in the chair? Just hold still. <coughs> sure, I probably can. Just move your head just a little bit. Keep your shoulders to the chest. Ready? Don't drift. Okay. Again. Thanks a lot, Lily May. Let's get back to the stomping ground. That was a good one. Sorry. I thought that was the monotone. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're the director. We've got. Okay, start the other one. Hi, Lily Mae Ledford. How are you doing? Very well. I'd like to interview a little bit about your career and, and start way back. Where were you born? I was born in Powell County of Kentucky and uh, the only place our county seat was Stanton but I lived nowhere near it and about as far away from it as we could get in a place called the Red River Gorge and I was raised there until the age of 19 when I left to go into radio. How many sisters and brothers <coughs> did you have? Well there was 14 nuts. My mother gave birth to 14 children and four died in infancy. And then she raised an orphan cousin and that made 11 of us that she raised to adulthood. Did you grow up in a musical family? Yes, my father was a wonderful musician with his fiddle and five string banjo. And uh, then the, my brothers took it up some and one became a very, very good fiddler. And then uh, I took it up when I was six or seven and then later my sisters took it up. And before my daddy was my granddaddy Ledford, who was a, a left-handed fiddler. And back of him, I, I don't know what went on. <laughs> now, did you learn directly from your father? Did he sort of give you lessons, or did you just sort of pick no, it up? No, nobody showed me anything, but we heard him play every night of the world, and then sometimes through the day, he was, we were poor farmers, you know, and, uh, and he'd come home to eat dinner while he would, uh, play for a while, learn shade and tree, and then again that night. So uh, a lot in the winter time when we all had to stay indoors a lot. And he'd play for us every single night, just a fiddle. We didn't have a banjo all the time, but uh, we had them from time to time. They were usually old homemade things and, and uh, would soon tear up or wear out or my brother would leave home and take it with him. And so we had a pretty hard time keeping the banjo around. Then the fiddle finally fell off the wall and bursted. My daddy kept it hanging down. And then we didn't have any fiddle for two years. And that was awful. We didn't have any music, you know, in the house. And there was uh, very few, there were very few families lived up and down the, the Red River Gorge. And um, so we didn't have anywhere to go to hear more music. I had one cousin I learned some things from, but I hardly ever got to go to see her. She lived so far away. I learned some banjo pieces off of her. She picked the banjo and sung. And uh, I don't know, we managed to gather up a little here and a little there. But uh, it does go back to my granddaddy Ledford. In back of that, I don't know. Now, you anymore. mentioned some uh, homemade instruments. Can you describe one of the homemade instruments that, that you'd have around the house? Well, we first got a banjo that my daddy traded the boy out of that come spend the night. <clears throat> and. Uh, it was a, a factory made one, a, a very old cheap banjo, and, and me and my brothers, all of us fighting over it, we, we, we wore it out pretty soon. So my brothers started to make one. They, they took a two or four inch band of, of green hickory wood, 
and and built a rim with it, uh, a round rim, and they uh, fastened it together, I guess, with wire or something. I don't know, don't remember. Then they made one just a little ha hair bigger, you know, and we'd uh, we'd uh, take a groundhog hide, dig a hole in the ground, and put this groundhog hide down in there, and you'd you'd put wood ashes over it, and then we'd wet it. And you kept it watered for a few days, and the hair would all begin to slip pretty soon. Then you'd take that out and scrape it thin on both sides, stretch it on a barn door or someplace, and scrape it real thin, and that was your, your uh, hide for the banjo. Then uh, you would put it over the, the small rim and force the big one down over it, and then let it dry and get good and tight, you know, like, just like a drum. And then they'd, uh, they'd cut out a square hole, I guess, Best I remember here, and then, and uh, here I believe that that uh, they put the, put the neck through. They'd whittle it out, and uh, they'd put it through this hole, and then from this end they'd fasten it with a nail. Guess I don't remember how they did it. And then they, of course, uh, burned holes and then rim reamed them out with their knives, pocket knives, for the keys. Then they whittled the keys out, and they whittled the bridge out, and they whittled this uh, part out that were to anchor the strings, and I don't know just how they did that, but it seemed like it was made out of wood, and they, they burnt little holes for their, to put strings through. Then you could, uh, then it's all ready, except strings, you ordered those from a sales order catalog for 10 or 15 cents, and then uh, they would all start fighting over it again. And uh, the boys there, the little girls to touch it, they hung theirs clear up to the top of the house, and I remember, when I was about seven, when they made one, and dared me to touch it. And I, I would scoot a table over by the wall and put a chair on top of the table. As soon as they got out to work and in the, in the fields, I would get up on that and up on the chair and, and get that banjo down and run off, go up the holler, up on the hill somewhere with it. And then that's the way I learned, and try to get it back before the boys come home. And then the, the fiddle, I traded a little boy out of the fiddle that, uh, we had, as I say, we hadn't had any music for two years in the house. And I, I was picking greens by the river one day, and the little boy come down the path, uh, swinging an old fiddle along. And I saw him knock a tree branch out of his eyes. I wanted that fiddle so bad I couldn't stand it. And all those old tunings of my daddy's, all those old tunes were still in my head. And I wanted, I knew if I could get a hold of one I could play. I knew I could. And I ran up to him, I said, Watch what you're doing to that fiddle. You're going to tear it up. He said, well, it's mine. I said, well, don't you care anything about it? He said, well, no, I can't play. He said, my uncle gave it to me. He said, I stayed with him last night. He said, uh, I thought I'd just take it home and trade it off, see what I'd get out of it. And I said, well, if you said it, come go home with me, and I'll try to find you some things to trade with. I took him home, and he, uh, I hunted up everything I could, and, uh, pair of gum boots and my slingshot and uh, all little old sweater. Kept bringing out little things. An old flashlight that was, didn't have any bulb in it or any, it wouldn't burn. And uh, had a big dent in the side of it. It's a metal flashlight, I remember. And he still uh, looked at all that, you know, and kind of looked scornful of all of it. And I saw he wasn't going to trade and I had to go get my most precious possession on earth that I had was my box of crayons that I kept hid, hidden way back up there in the house, wrapped up in some things to hide them from my little brother and sisters, to, to preserve them, you know, from them. And a box of crayons was hard to come by. They only cost a nickel or 10 cents, but that was hard to come by. So uh, I went and got that and he traded. And there went my crayons, but I thought I got the best end of the deal. I commenced to work, picked up my fiddle, and Mama come as Corwin. She saw right then that she was, wasn't going to get any work out of me. And I had to run off with it, you know, and get away from her. And to keep her from hollering at me and want me to come on and do ch chores. We didn't call them chores. We, she called it work. <laughs> but anyway, we had an old white dirty workhorse and uh, named Charlie. And I started looking for him to get some hair to go on my bowl. I was going to make me a bowl. And he was in the barn, and I cut a big hunk of hair out of his tail. He didn't care. So I uh, <laughs> tied that peach end of a green willow stick, notched the stick, and then 
took wire and wrapped it around as tight as I could get it. I wanted to get a tight bow. And the more I tightened my bow, the more it raised up till it was in a half circle, you know. <laughs> and that's the kind of bow I had. And then the fiddle, I stopped up the cracks around where it was coming apart, around the edges with some, some kind of the bluish clay mud. You know, it doesn't have any sand in it. They had a lot of that up there in, in that part of the country. And I stopped up the cracks with that and let it, that dry out good. Then I, I whittled out what we call the apron in this part where the strings are anchored. I whittled that out and somehow wired it on my fiddle. I don't remember just how I did, but I fastened it so it would stay. And I burnt the little holes with a red hot wire like I'd see my daddy do. And then I whittled out the, the bridge and the, the keys and the whole thing. And then I found some old scrap banjo strings to string it up with. And then I got some rosin out of the pine stump. It was oozing out and uh, gotten hard. And uh, old Charlie's Taylor was kind of yelling and greasy, you know. So it, it was slick, it was too slick, it's like a meat skin. And uh, rosin my bowl with that and, went, and, and, and stayed off from Mama all day that day way up that nearly clear to the cliff on a, behind a big boulder. It, it was nearly as big as this barn. And I got behind that and I thought she can't hear me and I can't hear her hollering for me. So I stayed there. Uh, you have to fight your mama sometime for your music or anybody else tries to keep you from it. But anyway, she felt, I think she felt by then that I'd never mount the hill of beans that she just told me that, that she got mad enough. But I stayed up there all day. I learned to play Callahan that first day and part of old Joe Clark <coughs> and uh, Sarah Mountain, a few simple tunes. And I used the old A tuning. We called it uh, A tuning. No, that's not what we called it. Well, anyway, they call it cross tuning now. We, uh, I used that. That requires less note than bowing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned all the tunes I'd ever heard. Uh, in that tuning before I started with the regular tuning. But anyway, I went home that night. It was getting nearly dark. And the, oh, there was all kinds of things to do. And I, I didn't want to go in the house. I dreaded Mama. And I, I carried two, two buckets of water from the branch and watered the cabbage and the mater plant. And then I took in a load of stove wood as I went for her to go burn in the cook stove. And thought that would get on the good side of her, you know. But, working. She said, now, Lily Mae, you laid off that old fiddle all day. Now, you help me get the fiddles on the table. I said, <coughs> you were getting ready to wear me to death with that. I was afraid she'd whip me, but she didn't. So uh, then that night, I said, well, she's going to wait till after supper, and then she's going to take me out in the backyard and get her a switch and, and let me have it. But she didn't do that. And that's she mama had quarreled a lot over us girls fooling with music, but that was the last time she ever bothered me about that, about my fiddling. Now, you say you, you left home when you were 19. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to leave Kentucky? Well, there wasn't nothing there to, to do in it but the, the whole corn for people and whole corn for yourselves and just har a hard life, you know. And uh, besides, but then they were having fiddle contests and amateur contests down at Stanton, the county seat. It's Stanton, but we always call it Stanton up there. And uh, they were having those down there, and uh, me and my little brother was, people were coming after us, and we'd walk across the mountain to their cars. They'd get us back and forth to these things and give us a chance. And there's where we started being seen, and they started winning the fiddling contest. And if I didn't win it, he would. He seen that my dad got a hold of us better fiddle when the mine fell apart, and he, uh, he began catching me in, passing me up on the fiddle right away. We were playing for square dances up and down the river. And then we began playing those contests, and little by little, word got around, and we eventually, I worked my way into radio, and I had my brother with me, and my sister Rosie, and a neighbor boy. We had a little band called Red River Ramblers. And uh, we were auditioned, and uh, I was the only one they could use. And it was- Now, who it, did you audition for? We auditioned for uh, people at WLS, John Lair was in on it. He was planning his own Renfro Valley barn dance then, but we, we didn't know it. But he was wanting to uh, 
preserve me for that. He had that all girls band in mind then. And he thought that I'd be right for that. But the others were told that they couldn't use them. And uh, he, he got us the audition, Mr. Larry did at WLS. And we went to some friends in Indiana that had come to the river and heard us play, took us to it. We were auditioned up there. And I was chosen and told to go back home and then stay until he called me, that there was to be a big amateur contest over here in Rock Castle County. And that uh, to come to that, he felt sure I'd win it. But he couldn't get me on WLS by himself. He was going to bring the program director from there, Harold Sappard. And he says he'll see for himself, and I believe you'll win that contest. We're inviting people from everywhere. I, we were taken again by these same friends from Indiana had relatives living on the river. They came and took us to that, and we won first place, and Mr. Lair, a five-year manager's contract from Mr. Lair. WLS wanted me to sign, too, and they got me away from Mr. Lair and talked about a, a contract. I don't know what would have happened if I'd have signed with them instead of Mr. Lair, but I feel like the Coon Creek girls might never have been born, you know, if now, that happened. were the Coon Creek girls the first all they, they call them all girl bands down in yeah. that time. Was it the they first They were the all first all girl string, string band. Because that's been searched and researched and again and again and again. I never thought much about it at the time. Because I'd played with girl musicians before. Not many. There were a few around home. No fiddlers. The band, well, band picker here and there. But uh, to me, I didn't think much about it. But it, it, the audience hadn't been used to it. Or our listeners, or fans. They hadn't been used to all girl bands, you know, it's all boy, boy bands, boy bands. And they begin to uh, uh, really pamper us, you know, and, and uh, support us and come see us and bring us things. And so Mr. Lair had us on WCKY in Covington. It was then in Covington. It's in Cincinnati now. The rest of them were across the river in Cincinnati when he organized his burn dance, and he threw them on all radio stations around Cincinnati with us girls on Covington. I believe it was a 10,000 watt station. Covered several states well, you know. We had 30 minutes a day and we took like wildfire. And uh, then we took it from there. And then is, it, is it true while you were on WLS that somebody once sent you a live possum in the mail? They sent me a live possum in the mail and it just tore the, the mail room all to pieces and uh, Mr. Safford, who was program director, who was a nervous man anyhow, his face was twitching over time that day, wanted me to come and do something with that possum. I said, Mr. Safford, <coughs> I've still got two programs that I have to be on. Came in on Saturday. On Saturday was our, our work day. We were on several times a day on Saturday. I, I can't go until I, get, until I get through this program or that. And uh, by golly, they gave it to me. I went down and got it. It was in a cradle, little one, little baby Who one. Who sent it to you? I don't remember his name. It's been too long ago. Do you remember why? I remember writing to him about it. <laughs> huh? We'd been talking about me being homesick uh, on the station and, and, uh, and uh, a lot of other fun things we talked about. We might have talked about possum and possum hunting. Red Foley and Girls of Golden West was on a daily program with me. and. Uh, then one night I cried on the burn dance when a little boy uh, hitchhiked from down southern Indiana came up there and they let him be on the, sh the stage on the, on the burn dance, national burn dance. They let him uh, make an appearance and he looked kind of pitiful and uh, he, uh, he had a, a coat way too big for him, you know, and he looked like a, a poor child and of course he'd, he'd hitchhiked. And I felt such a great sympathy when I saw them out there interviewing him, and they put him on the play. Boy, they called for a backup guitar, too, and, and that little boy played that fiddle. He was full of confidence. He wasn't, had no fear whatsoever. He just made it talk. Boy, he was good. Well, I come his crying and thinking about Coyne, my brother back home. Good little fiddler, too, but didn't make it, didn't get to make an appearance on Barney. So when they called, uh, Jack Holden was the announcer, and he called me up there to, to meet that little boy and was t already about to cry all over the place. And, he, and I started to put my arm around him. 
He wanted me to say what I thought of this little boy hitchhiking all the way from Indiana. It's something like the hard time you had getting here, you know. And uh, I started to say something and burst out crying and just tears just streamed and poured and splashed all over my clothes and all over. I had dammed up all that homesickness so three or four months or longer. And uh, this brought it to a head right in front of thousands of people and everybody on the show. I was embarrassed. I, I, I got off stage and as quickly as I could, embarrassed to death, and went out and tried it out. And when I come back, I thought, oh my gosh, the way they tease me and torment me around here, imitate me and mi mimic me and lisp like me, uh, they'll never let me live this down. And uh, they didn't, I wasn't teased the first time about that. I wasn't scolded. Nobody acted embarrassed. Red was crying when I went back out. He was sitting there with Lula Bell and she was wiping a few tears. Some in the audience were. And uh, so they saw that it wasn't a, it, it was a genuine thing with me. I don't guess they hardly knew why. Because I hadn't told them, you know, that it's, it's like my little brother or that I was homesick or anything. So someone- But they knew it somehow or the other that it was genuine, a uh, genuine uh, tears, you know. Yes, we have school and everybody to watch. Yeah, I, um, was it 1939 that you played at the White House? 1939, that was right. Now how did that happen? Baskin Lamar Lunsford of Asheville, North Carolina, who was already in the festivals and had Mrs. Roosevelt interested in what he was doing there, took a festival into Washington, D.C that spring. I think that was May. And uh, asked Mr. Lair to let us go and appear on it. And he brought several other people from North Carolina and throughout the Appalachians, I guess, to be on it too. And uh, it was a three-day festival. And it, we didn't have very big crowds and seemed like the audience who'd never heard us was too far away from home to hear us on radio. They didn't seem to go for us too much. But, uh, <clears throat> there was a very important lady there attending those festivals that we didn't know about right then. So we, were, we played the festival and went on back home and, and in a few days we called to Mr. Lara's office and he's, he, he uh, told us what was going to take place, that the King and Queen of England was, was King George VI and Queen Elizabeth were paying their first visit to this country and were uh, Mrs. Roosevelt was wanting to present a concert for them of all American music, types of music, and that, that we had been chosen by her from the festival to represent the Appalachians. I believe they called it the Ohio Valley at that time, Ohio Valley. So, uh, oh, we, we couldn't take it in. We, we were too silly to be scared, you know, of uh, the king and queen. <laughs> We just thought it'd be like playing a schoolhouse or a theater or <laughs> auditorium of some kind. And that we, you know, uh, we won't do the best we could, but he said, you're not to wear your long calico dresses and old shoes. <clears throat> and he said, you're, you're, uh, you're to wear summer dresses, street dresses, and, and to wear uh, rather low heels and silk hose. So uh, we worked that out ourselves. So Mr. Larratt said, you may be presented and may not, we don't know. But he tried to explain to us how to curtsy, you know, for him, and he's a kind of rotund man, and he got up to show us, he liked to fail, and we all got to laughing. But anyway, we went home and uh, began to work on what we were going to wear. So we decided on a white dress for me to represent the lily, and the uh, with Daisy, well, white and gold or green, we didn't know what to do with her. And violet, purple or purple and lavender print. They were all voile, sheer dresses. And rosy pink with roses printed on it. And a, a lace midriff and a lace around here and the sleeves. And, and they were real beautiful dresses and violet made her own. And Daisy wore a green voile one with the big daisies printed on it. We thought that was about the neatest thing there was for us to do that, you know. So uh, we, w we were taken up there by Mr. and Mrs. Lair and uh, an organizing committee of three people, woman and two men, took us over at once when we got to the hotel 
we were not to leave the hotel for any reason without them with us. And so we uh, went the next day and was to rehearse a little on the White House lawn and in the some room downstairs, a library room of some kind, or a morning room, well, I don't know what you call the rooms, but anyway, we were given that to rehearse in. Then we were to go to the East Ballroom when it was free and, and rehearse getting on the stage and getting off. Well, we went, did all of that. Then uh, when it came out, we went that night and Mr. and Mrs. Lair's car was stopped at the gate. We were riding with the organizing committee and uh, a limousine type car. And uh, at the gate, uh, it was heavily guarded and then guards were planted every so many feet all the way to the White House, across the White House <coughs> lawn. And uh, Mr. Lair was stopped. He had the bass fiddle in the car. That's where he was going to get in, but he had the whole bass fiddle for the country girl. So he wasn't invited? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it tickled me that we, they, we saw back, he was having trouble back there with the guards, and Mrs. Lair had been turned back right there and, and sent back home. And she left crying. And uh, we waited for him to get through, and they took the case off the base fiddle, they shook it, they shone flashlights down in it, and I don't know what they were looking for, but anyway, he came walking then behind us with the base fiddle, carrying it to, up the drive, and I thought, have times, have changed, back home he's king, and we were the subjects, you know, <laughs> little children. And here he are riding up there, and here we are riding up there in a limousine, and he's coming, walking, carrying our bass fiddle for us. And I thought, well, how, how different it is back home, you know. What was the show like, the, performing for the president? It was the, uh, they had uh, uh, opera, that was Lawrence Tibbet, a uh, singer, and uh, they had uh, classical, Marian Anderson, they had uh, Tate Smith, popular. They had Alan Lomax, Western folk songs. They had us, Appalachian. Was it they a good response? There was, well, the response at some affair like that is never highly enthusiastic. We got enough attention, but not, nobody overdid it. Not with their majesties there, you know. But anyway, they had uh, 89 guests besides it. King and Queen and the Rosa Delta in there, governors and their wives and senators, you know. Is there and, a... Uh, there was a hundred black men and women that sang old spirituals. Oh, really? They were next to last. Then last was Bascom and Mary Lunsford and his square dancers, and us girls played the music for them. I, is there another event in the Coon Creek Girls' career, your own career, that really stands out as a highlight, something that you'll never forget because it was so wonderful or exciting? Well, that, I can't think of anything except um, our recording session was was exciting. Yet uh, it was Art Satterley of Chicago that had us come up to, he was our producer, and Mr. Lair, of course, took us to that and took A90. It was his star act, A90 and Little Clifford were his star act on the burn down. He took her to do four songs, and we did eight. And uh, that was in 38. That's, that's about it. What's up? <coughs> Excuse me. Lily, Lily, Lily May, could you just play us another song? Anything that you feel like playing? <coughs> All right. <coughs> Let me cough good first. Okay. <coughs> I kind of ran on on this. You can, uh, but I didn't know what was wanted, so I kept telling it all. I'm okay. sorry. What I want is the water. I wonder where it went. To. It's, uh. Yeah, pull yourself out of that. Thank you so much. Is that all right? Lord, what ought I pick? <laughs> I thought he's still in you. Oh, 